Hey, everybody, it's the Drive School Podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, your host, Pastor Bradamire, my friend. How are you? I'm doing really good. It's a beautiful spring day here today. Yeah, we were, I, I was with uh, Pastor Richard just a little bit ago. It's the same, us Midwesterners, man. You can roll the window down in the pickup once and everybody's just in a whole different mindset. Um, I, 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 same comment there. Life's real good. So we've been tackling questions, you and me. Um, and and here, here's one for you, Pastor. Uh, is there a wrong way to worship? Yes. All right. Next question. Yeah, that's okay. Can, can <laughs> clue, <laughs> this is valid. Clue me in a little bit though, because I don't want to do it wrong. Well, okay. So Jesus tells us that we're supposed to worship in spirit and truth. And the question then comes down to what does that mean? And typically where people go wrong is they kind of take that in kind of this juju sort of direction, you know, this this mystical I feel feely, the feely, spirit. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. I'm right. This is fine. It might be heartburn. It might be the spirit. But either way, I look inside myself for validation that I'm worshiping rightly. Mm-hmm. And from this springs a whole host of errors. This is where you get the people who are, you know, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't need to go to church. I don't need to hear the word preached to me. I don't need to have the sacraments. I can just do it in spirit and truth fishing or whatever, thinking thinking vague thoughts about Jesus. And so one of the ways we do it wrong is when we look inside ourselves for God, rather than letting God come to us through his word and sacrament. When Jesus talks about, you know, worshiping in spirit and truth, he means that we actually are receiving the truth, which is the word of God and the actual Holy Spirit who comes to us as through means. I think that's actually th- that that last little bit's going to shape a lot of it, right? The Holy Spirit works through means. And so inside of the divine service, there are the things that are given by God for you to forgive your sins. Those are the means of grace, uh, the, the, the preaching, the administration of the sacraments. And then there's a bunch of other stuff that points to that. Mm-hmm. And and those things are are helpful. They, they're, they're good. But like, let's just start with the fact that God actually has things in mind when it comes to church. He, he has baptism in mind. He has the Lord's Supper in mind. He has absolution, preaching in mind. Those things are supposed to be a part of worship. And if they're not, you're worshiping wrong. Right. And that's, I think, where, where a lot of folks go wrong in our present day and age. You know, the, the old theologians called that enthusiasm. The idea is that I find it inside of myself. Mm-hmm. And we really should remember that the general movement of the church is first God comes to speak to us, and then we can respond to that with things like praise and thanksgiving. Or if, And if you define worship that way as praise and thanksgiving, which... I don't know, maybe isn't the most you know beneficial way of understanding worship. Um, but if we want to talk about it that way, that only happens in response to God speaking his word. Sure. So like, for example, you come to an average Lutheran church. We did setting three last Sunday out of the Lutheran service book, the old common service. So we get to church, we have a hymn. What's the hymn about? Well, it relates to something that's going on that day. We try to pick them to the readings, right? It's about who God is and what he does for us. Then the next thing we do is we have an invocation. We call on our God. We have our confession. We do the intro. It. We have the readings. We have a sermon. Anyways, the point is, is that it starts out right away at the beginning. The first liturgical act is remembering that we're baptized, calling on God's name, and then confessing our sins and receiving forgiveness. And in that way, we remind ourselves that this all started when God baptized me and brought me into his kingdom by water and the word. Mm-hmm. And then I can respond. So when we get to the parts where we are singing God's praises, that's out of thanksgiving for what he's done for us. Right. That That's actually a good thing. Like it, it, we even talked about this already with the world. It got nice out. It turned into spring. I rolled the windows down and I was in a good mood. That That's mm-hmm. a real thing. And God be praised for it. The problem with enthusiasm is when you start to measure by that feeling. So you think it's not working unless I feel something. And the mm-hmm. problem with that, the reason that this is so dangerous is because whenever you need God the most, he will always feel the farthest away just Mm -hmm. every single time. And the the joy of, well, a boring church service, uh, in all honesty, is that it's it's measured as to being working based on God's promises rather than your response to it. Because like, if I'm hungry, I'm not going to pay attention to just about anything that isn't food. It doesn't mean that it's not real. I've been staring at my phone and almost walked into traffic. That doesn't mean the truck isn't real. It just means I'm not not clued in. Um, And enthusiasm is, is all sort of in what are you paying attention to? And well, as a sinner, sometimes you pay attention to sinful things. Well, often we pay attention to sinful things. Not just sometimes. I mean, it's it's quite you regular. Say it like that hurt my feelings. No, that's my that's my goal here. All of these videos, I just want to make you feel bad, Harrison. So far, so good. Let's keep going. <laughs> um, all right. So enthusiasm is a dangerous pit. Like you, you will have responses to God. God will preach His law, and it will produce in you contrition. It not not perfectly, but it but it will, and it will His His gospel will produce in you hope, praise, thanksgiving, joy. Not perfectly but it will. We just don't want to measure those things. They'll be there. That's good. That's that's fantastic. We we sing the right hymns around that. Like in, in Lent, we sing more contrite hymns. That That's fine. But we we want the things that are producing 
those emotions, not measuring the emotions themselves. So we want the pure preaching of God's law in all of its truth and purity, the, the pure preaching of God's gospel in all of its sweetness. Keep going then, so, so that I don't fall off another, another side of the horse. <laughs> well, I think that that's a central insight, right? We so often want to confuse the effects of God's word with mm. the thing that actually gives us salvation, which is God's word. Right. And so instead of looking to what God says and promises, I instead look to how I feel. And the number of times as a pastor, you have conversations with people who are worried about their faith. I don't have strong enough faith. I don't know if I actually believe any of this stuff because they don't feel a particular way. It's it's very, very high. And it's very distressingly common, even amongst Lutherans, because that's what we're told religion is. Religion is just simply, yeah, it's just, it's, it's what we feel. And that's not what religion is. Religion, true religion, Christianity is God who speaks to us and works on us through his means of grace. That's what it is. And it doesn't matter if I feel a particular way or I like it, or I'm even really paying attention to it. God does what he does and it doesn't depend on me. It's always that's dependent helpful. on him. That That's so helpful because that means I can't mess it up. Right. Because if we could mess, mess it up, up. We, yeah. well, if we could mess it up, we would have. In fact, we try regularly. You know, that's, <laughs> that's one of the natures of being a sinner. Right. So, so with this in mind, then we can focus on that part being in worship. Worship can be done wrong if you don't have the gifts that God gives there. Are there other ways that, that worship is is done wrong? Well, I think neglecting the Word of God more broadly, right? So we're talking primarily about the gospel, the forgiveness, the life, the salvation that comes with God. But as you kind of already mentioned, we also need the law, the condemnation of what is wrong, and we need that whole counsel of God's Word, not just the gospel. Now, the gospel is the main thing. Jesus came to save us, not to condemn us, but the law what? has to be there. Yeah. If the law is not there, then we're depriving you of something good that God has said because the law is good. So we need both of those things. So the, which means, and I, I tell this to all of the new members I get here, you know, like all seven or whatever we've had in the last seven years, because I'm in rural North Dakota. But when we sit down and we talk about, you know, what is a sermon? Because that's just something I like to talk to people about. I said, there's two things you should hear in every sermon. You should hear me telling you that Christ has died for you and forgives you your sins. And you should hear that you're, you know, something that you believe, think, or do is wrong. And in fact, if I'm really doing my job, there should be occasional sermons where you come away kind of upset with me because I've really cut hosts close to home. Now, if I'm just beating you up all the time, then probably there's something that needs to be addressed there. But on occasion, you know, it should be personal enough that, oh man, pastor is really coming after me today. And, and for all of you who aren't pastors out there, um, that happens to the preacher too. Sometimes, you know, you, you got to preach on something and you go, Oh man, I don't want to say this cause this is me. <laughs> oh yeah. I, 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 you preach against 10 commandments, all of which you've broken I, every time. Right. So, so inside of this thing, then it's not just, you know, that Jesus saves you, but from like, from what it, it it's also that the law actually exists to, to describe not just all the reasons you're wrong, but it, the law exists to describe how things are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. and, and the law, like to, to, to cut close to home is simply just pointing out things ain't the way they're supposed to be. Um, and, and it's got a name to it. And, and first we need salvation from it. We need forgiveness for the places we've contributed to it. We need rescue from the places it's done to us, but also there, there's a place to even look at just the simple fact that like, well, things are supposed to be this way. Let's, let's lean into that. Like let, let, let's not actually try and make things worse. And, and so if, if a, picture of how things are supposed to be is, for example, love of your neighbor, then saying, you know, well, since Jesus died, let's all just be jerks to each other. That That's not okay. No, that's that's actually really bad. I, I know that's really rocketly, uh, not rocket science. Dang it. I messed that up. I was going to say, it must be quite profound for all of you, you know, people who know the, the gospel or anything about Jesus, right? But uh, it is a frustrating thing that... Um, so often our temptation is to cut off something that we should be doing together as Christians. You know, um, we, we want to, we have this temptation. We all want to fit in, right? I mean, that's, that's generally how it is. Nobody wants to be at odds with other people. And, you know, Jesus says very plainly that to follow him is to be at odds with the world. You know, father will be against son, mother against daughter. And uh, we don't want that. So we just ignore, downplay, or outright change some of the things that are part of true worship. So, you know, the gospel gets turned into, you know, self-help or five ways to improve your life. The law gets ignored or downplayed or rewritten so that it's just vague stuff like be nice to people or whatever. Sure. And uh, the, none of that is what God says. And by the way, one of the things that I, I like to tell people about the law is, you know, we Lutherans talk about the law a lot and we're kind of dour, you know, grumpy people, or at least that's what people think about us. I mean, and there's some truth to that. But um, the reason we do that is not because we're a bunch of masochists and sadists, right? We don't like to just inflict harm on others and inflict it on ourselves. The reason we talk about the law is the more we understand sin, 
the more we see what Jesus has done for us, the more it helps us understand the depth of the love of our Savior. There's an end to that that is not just feeling miserable. Right. The law is not supposed to leave you in despair. It's supposed to drive you to Jesus. Right. A- and the, Jesus has something to say about this. Uh, it, it, it's your sins are forgiven. Um, and there there you get to actually be a lot more honest with the law uh, and say that we're not actually dumbing it down so that you can do better at it, but but rather things are supposed to be a certain way. On the last day, they will be because Jesus died and rose. Uh, until then, let's let's continually bring our sins to Jesus and and strive to love our neighbor. Amen. But I think, though, that we, we are probably missing what everyone's going to expect us to talk about here, which is, does that mean then that I have to use, you know, one of the settings out of the hymnal or, or can I do something else? Right. That's that's usually where people go with this. It becomes about accoutrements Style. and not about foundation. Right. Sure. And so I guess, you know, OK, I'm a buy the book kind of guy. That's mm. that's how I roll. I like that. I do that for a few reasons. One is it helps me confess the communion of saints. We are part of a church that is bigger than just our present moment in place. It goes from the beginning of the world to the end of the world. And having continuity and consistency with that is a way to confess that and to impress that on ourselves and other people who might visit us. Alternatively, if we're coming up with something new all the time, that implies a disunity there that I don't think we mean to imply. And that's probably not the most useful thing to do. Plus, you know, if you look at like our divine service, this has got literally 2000 years of development on it. You know, people have been thinking about this and refining it for generations upon generations. If we do something different, it doesn't have that pedigree to it. It doesn't have that many years of thinking behind it. And I guess I'm just not confident enough in my academic and and liturgical abilities to come up with something that would replace that many years of reflective thought and practice by Christians. Well, and even just to kind of circle back to where we started, we we said there are the things that God gives during the service. Those are not optional. And there are the right. things that point to it, the, the things that are optional. How many candles do you light? Do you wear vestments? Those kinds of things. But but here's the, the reality. If they point, then then they, they kind of matter. Do you wanna mm-hmm. do you wanna tip at a restaurant where you have to put your food on a plastic tray by yourself and then clean up after yourself when you're gone? Or or do you wanna tip at a nice restaurant? Like where where they bring you the food and there's like napkins that aren't made of paper. <laughs> I know which one I'm more willing to tip at. And that's wait, not wait, because wait, wait, the burger is any better or worse, but but it's because of, of how it looks. Like, I don't want to tip you at McDonald's. You eat at restaurants that have non-paper napkins? On occasion, uh, on blessed <laughs> occasions, yes. Um, and because it, it it looks nicer, it makes the food seem nicer. That The napkin works, the paper one works just the same. It, it really does. Uh, because the thing I'm there for is the burger. But um, also, yes, I am the person who goes to fancy restaurants and orders hamburger. I'm fine with that. You can call me whatever you want. Um, but but if, it, if it is going to point to say that there's something worth having here, um, like if, if, you, if you went to see like the, the best steak dinner ever, you probably don't want it on a plastic tray. Um, and, and in the same way, if it is the body and blood of Jesus to forgive you your sins, if, if it is the place where heaven meets earth, well then point to that fact. And yeah, I'm not saying we... if you don't do it enough, he's not there, but like I'm dumb and don't pay attention. So help me see it. And I'll be more likely to tip you at the fast food restaurant if you use nicer things. Well, you know, um, this is one of those things that you know is a common attack on the church. We have um, nice stuff. Right, we have a nice silver chalice for doing. We could feed a lot of homeless people instead. Yeah, we could, and and okay, look, we could fade some people with that money. We could sell it and and use you know Dixie cups. I mean, there's nothing that would invalidate the sacrament in that. But if this really is the body and blood of Christ, you wouldn't set up a dinner at your house if God was present and give Him the Dixie cups and the disposable you know styrofoam plates. You'd bring out the nice china. And the reason we do that is not because it makes the supper, you know, better or more, you know, valid or something like that. It's because it helps us remember what we're doing. And the other thing we have to remember too, my church is 100 and I don't know, some change years old. We collected this stuff over the last 100 years. It's not like we just sat down right away in 1905 and wrote a check out for all of the things that we have. It took literally 100 years to assemble that. And when you break that down per year, it's not a lot of money. You know, it is, it really isn't. And on top of that, my church also gives like, I think last time I counted, we give like, you know, 20% of what we bring into charities of various sorts, you know, so it's not like churches aren't feeding people in order to have nice communion where that's just a, a false thing that people say. Well, but again, get back to what you're here to be doing. Um, and, and it's the same thing as, again, is there a wrong way to worship? We are here primarily to give Jesus for sinners. Now, Mm -hmm. that actually means something because the law says there's a way things are supposed to be so much that you're right. Your church should be doing something for the poor. 
but it's a whole lot better at forgiving the sinners. And, and there are a lot of other chor- charity organizations that are pretty good at giving food to the poor. They're, they're, they're really than terrible. Us. They're a hundred percent, but they're also way worse than us at forgiving the sinners because it's not their role. So let's let us stay in our lane, let them stay in theirs and we'll support you where we can. Your church mm-hmm. should be giving to some sort of charity because of love of neighbor. It, it should be. The, the law speaks here. But also the, the main point of your church, you, you can you can have a church w- with without a, a food bank. You cannot have a church without the Lord's Supper. Well, and the other thing too is, this is, I guess, something that really smells funny to me when I visit a church. Hmm. If you walk into the church and the emphasis is on us, what we want, we wanting to be entertained, we want to be dazzled, we want to have something that keeps our attention all the time, and not on the holy God who comes to us to save us, that right there smells off, and there's something wrong with that. And uh, so much of what I hear people trying to justify changing things like the divine service with is this sort of reasoning. It's for people. It's not about who God is and what he says. And I know the intentions are good. I don't want to say that, like, you know, everyone who does, you know, says that we need to, you know, have the rock band, the five-piece band or whatever in church is, is coming from a bad place. I think they really do mean well. They want people to hear about Jesus. That's a good thing. But the fact is, is Jesus actually shows up and there's something about respect and reverence that goes with having God in church. Right. So so when we talk about wrong ways to worship, we want to be clear. It, it's not you're using the wrong instruments, but if you're right. excluding the gifts of God, that's wrong. There, right. there are, however, ways that, that point to what's right and, and distinguish between the, the right and the wrong. And and again, that, that's an important distinction. It's not a must do, but it's it's a think about it kind of thing because it's it's actually easy to lose sight of these things. They, they well, I know what communion looks like. I know what it tastes like. I need something outside of my senses to to proclaim to me what it is. And the more ways, the better. Well, that's, I think, the the big takeaway from all of this, right? We human beings can take anything that's good that God gives us and turn it into something stupid about us. And that can be church. I mean, and that happens on both ends. You know, you got oh, yeah, the 100%. praise and worship people that, you know, guys like you and me kind of, we like to kind of rip on them a little bit. We can do and, it too. And, but the liturgical end of things, we can go nuts and make it all about the way you cross your thumbs and not about the gifts of Christ. And so we have to be careful that we don't take this stuff and turn it into some kind of, look at how pure I am litmus test, or look at how great I am at talking to others about Jesus litmus test. It should just be simply about God and his word and leave it at that. Where is Jesus? Look there. Amen. Thanks, Pastor.